G'day fellas and welcome back to another Age of Empires 4 video. In this video we're going to be taking a look at a tier list that I am doing up for all of the landmarks in Age of Empires 4. Now before we get into the tier list I do want to just provide the caveat to you that of course tier lists are subjective and that means that yours may differ. Now I'll leave a link in the description to where you can make your own tier list but just keep in mind, this is my opinion, it's subjective. I am not the Viper, so I'm sure his would be a little bit different to mine. Let's get into it. All right, the very first, uh, the landmark that we're going to be starting off with is the S tier landmarks. Then we'll be working our way through the remainder of the landmarks. So very first landmark that is S tier, it is, of course, the English, and it is, of course, the Council Hall. Council Hall S tier. Now, the reason why this landmark is S tier is because it acts as two archery ranges in the Second Age, and it trains those archers even faster. Now, archers or longbowmen are incredibly strong for the English. They are one of their core units in most of their armies that they run. And as a result, it is an investment of, you know, those 600 resources where you immediately get back those 300. So an incredibly strong landmark and sits very safely in the S tier. The next S tier landmark that is going to be coming up is, of course, another English landmark, and it is the King's Palace. King's Palace is typically the, the way I explain it to people is that often in Age of Empires 4, there's a couple of different options that you've got throughout the game, whether you want to begin making military or you want to go for your economy or you want to tech up. The reason why the King's Palace is so strong because you actually kill two birds with one stone. You tech up and you focus on your economy. It is an incredibly strong landmark because it acts as a town center and as a mechanism for you to age up. The next S tier landmark is actually not from the English. We move on to the next civilization. It's the Chinese. The Chinese have got an S tier landmark, which is this one right here, the Astronomical Clock Tower. With the way that the current meta is, the Astronomical Clock Tower is especially strong just because of the fact it gives an extra 50% HP over to any siege that it creates. Now, you might be thinking, Drongo, that's absolutely ludicrous. How could you keep up with enemy siege? Uh, if they're making, you know, from four or five siege engineering or siege workshops, how are you going to be able to, to keep up? Well, you can supervise this bad boy as well, which is another Chinese mechanic. And that's how it is so damn strong because you can get all of those good stuff out of there. So bombards in the late game especially become overpowered, in my opinion, because of this landmark. And sprinkles in the mid game are very strong as well. Now moving on to the next landmark that sits in the, the S tier. And it is, of course, from the French. And it is the School of Cavalry. So very similarly to the English uh, Council Hall. The School of Cavalry is incredibly strong because it gives you the equivalent of 150 wood immediately upon age up, and that is that stable. And then on top of that, for the remainder of the game, it's going to reduce the time it takes to be training that cavalry. And it's just such a strong bonus. There's two components to it. The first one is that immediate bonus, being that 150 wood for the stable that not only, you know, you, if your enemy wants to make a stable, they're going to have to wait 30 seconds for it to come up because of the training time. You're going to have yours immediately. As the French, you typically want to be making royal knights. So there's a lot of great synergy there with the civilization. Next S tier landmark is actually from the Holy Roman Empire, and it is the Regnitz Cathedral. The Regnitz Cathedral is part of the reason why we've seen so many people going for fast castle strategies with the Holy Roman Empire. And that is a huge reason why the civilization actually has uh, the majority of its strength. If it wasn't for this landmark, it would be a very safe, you know, F tier civilization. But the fact that this landmark exists, it means that it's able to bring it up at least to D tier. Uh, to be honest, it's probably closer to C tier because it is still a very viable civilization on a number of maps. Obviously, just not the best civilization, but... The Regnitz Cathedral, obviously uh, tripling up the gold that relics provide, is part of the reason why uh, it is it is just so damn good. Uh, if you can get up to a fast castle, you know, eight, nine minutes, that sort of thing, and get this bad boy out and get it fully loaded, you're going to be in a great position to win the game. The next S tier landmark is the Deer Stones, which comes in from the all-important uh, Mongols, and the Mongols are going to enable, or the Deer Stones are going to enable you to basically have max movement speed army anywhere around the map that you want. So you can pick these Deer Stones up, you can move them, uh, you can take them over to your enemy's base, you can sit them right there. It is a landmark that is incredibly good. It also gives you a, um, a Castle Age technology that's not available until the Castle Age, and as a result, it's, it's quite a strong um, age up in that second age. The next Landmark that we're going to be talking about is for the Rus. The Rus's S tier landmark is the Golden Gate. This is a great landmark that just helps you really balance your economy. So you're going to be throughout the game having difficulty 
with your economy and that's a normal part of the game but this allows you to balance it and always allows you to take a favorable trade which is really really great because it just means you know there might be a time where you're floating a little bit too much wood and you need that gold you just sell off some wood it's very very simple there's a lot of great strategies that you can build around this you can go for a fast second town center you can go for a fast castle there's there's just so much it's very versatile so that's why it's one of the best landmarks in the game at the moment next landmark that's going to be sitting up in the s tier it is going to be the delhi sultanate and it is going to be their dome of the faith the dome of the faith is uh, a very strong landmark so the, the delhi have a lot of uses for their scholars and the dome of the faith reduces the cost of scholars down by half which is so important because as the delhi you are going to want at least you know at least like six scholars in your mosques you're going to want scholars in your buildings uh in your military production buildings you'll need scholars to get out on the map you need scholars to get in your your final landmark uh, down here uh which is the palace of the sultan uh there, there's so many reasons why you want scholars and to have them cheaper it's an it's a huge benefit to them so then the final landmark that is going to be sitting up in the S tier, uh, which at the moment, uh, you know what, I, I, I'm going to probably change my mind here. I'm not going to put it in the S tier, but we will put it in the A tier and we'll make it the first one in the A tier. It's actually the economic wing of the Abbasid dynasty. So originally I had this pegged at S tier, but I don't think it is S tier. I think it might be A tier uh, just because you don't have to always go it. You can open other... Um, you can have other openings here. You can definitely open military wing. You can definitely open uh, economic wing. And so that is the part of the reason why I don't think it sits up in that S tier. Uh, but it is incredibly strong just because of fresh foodstuffs. That is the primary reason why this landmark or why this age up, this uh, this wing of the House of Wisdom is going to be sitting up in the A tier just simply because of fresh foodstuffs, reducing the cost down of those villages. The next landmark that we're going to be putting in there is the English. Uh, and it is, of course, the Berkshire Palace. And this bad boy right here is one of the best defensive landmarks in the game. Uh, in my opinion, it is probably the best defensive landmark in the game. Uh, the only thing that would really rival it, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but it's, it's from the French. Um, and it is incredibly strong uh, just simply because of the extra range that it gets. So you can get um, emplacements on this as well. Chuck on a cannon emplacement and it gets increased range. It gets, I think it's a, a range of 15, uh, which outranges every unit in the game except for the trebuchet. It's the only unit that doesn't get outranged by this uh by this uh, landmark so an incredibly strong landmark next one up is the guild hall from the french so the guild hall you guys will know this landmark it's quite infamous you set and you forget and then you come back a few minutes later and all of a sudden you've got six thousand food sitting there and you're like oh all right i guess i'll take that it is a an amazing landmark uh that really just gives you so much power throughout the mid and throughout the late game you can put this bad boy on gold on stone and you're going to have a constant form of income for yourself uh, and it's just going to really enable you to power through. So a really, really strong landmark. The next one that's going to be in the ATR is also another French landmark. It is the College of Artillery. This is a, a landmark that enables the French to get access to the culverin. So without this landmark, they don't have access to the culverin. And because of that, it makes it very strong because the culverin is a very strong unit. It's especially strong at the moment in the current meta. So if you're going for a fast um, uh, Imperial, you're probably going to want to be going up with this landmark just because in the Springled meta, culverin are very strong. They can one-shot culverin and you can heal them up. They've got a lot of HP. So that's part of the reason why they're so good. And of course, they're, they're royal. Uh, so it means they've, they've got that little bit of extra damage. So that's part of the reason why. Next landmark in the A tier is the Arkan Chapel. The Arkan Chapel is... You know, one of the Holy Roman Empire's uh, strongest aspects as well. Chuck a prelate in this bad boy and you're going to be buffing up villages in a radius. It is the gift that keeps on giving. In the early game, you can get it on a gold mine uh, as well as a wood line, as well as all your villages on sheep under the town center. That's perfect. And then it transitions over into the mid game and the late game where you build your mills around it. So it's a very, very strong landmark and it just keeps on giving throughout the game a great economic landmark and a really, really uh, strong one. Uh, the next one is... Um, I guess a little bit com controversial, the Palace of Swabia. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Palace of Swabia. I think it is a great landmark. And the reason why is because you can go fast. If there's there's a couple of civs that I think Fast Imperial is, is viable for. Uh, the first one is the Chinese, and the second one is the Holy Roman Empire. And obviously at the moment, they're considered to be both the weakest civs. But I think as the meta begins to become more greedy, we are going to see these civilizations begin to build up through the meta. And as a result, it means the Palace of Swabia becomes stronger. This landmark enables you to create villages at four times the speed and at four at uh, one fourth of the cost. So incredibly strong for booming. It is it is four town centers in one single building. It's also cheaper. 
uh, than your other age four landmark, which is down here, this bad boy, the Ellsback Palace. So it is, uh, it's the the cheapest age four age up that you can get in the game. It is, uh, it's just a very solid uh, landmark, and it's very rare that you wouldn't be going with this. And it definitely encourages you to get up to that imperial age uh, as quickly as possible. So the next landmark is going to be from the Mongols, and it is the Step Redoubt. So the Step Redoubt is another great economic landmark. It essentially gives you an extra 50% gold wherever you are on the map. So that 8,000 gold mine that is the last remaining gold mine on the map, go and put this bad boy over near it. Congratulations. Now it's 12,000 gold. That's what makes the Step Redoubt so strong. Also, during um, Fast Castles, uh, which, as, as I mentioned earlier, is the current meta, you get this step read out down. You put 10 villages on gold. Congratulations. You've got the equivalent of 15 villages. So you've got that extra five villages out of nowhere. You can. It also becomes very efficient to actually trade with your gold as well. So you can get, you know, 20 villages up there onto the step read out and have them all moving in with wheelbarrow. It makes it very efficient for uh, gathering gold. And then you can use that to further trade resources at your market. So very, very strong. Um, and enables the Mongols to have a significant horde uh, in that mid-game period. Uh, the next A-tier landmark is this bad boy right down here. It is the White Stupa. This offers you a second uh, Uvu, essentially, and it never runs out, so it's just incredibly strong. Um, and there's so many good things that you can do with stone as the Mongols. It's just, it is a no-brainer when it comes to picking this landmark. It is very, very strong. Uh, there's a lot of upgrades that you want to get as the Mongols that are, are improved. There's a lot of, you know, units that you can build in the late game as well, as long as you're down next to an Uvu. And that part of that is uh, why it is just so damn strong. Next landmark is going to be for the Rus. It is the Abbey of the Trinity. The Abbey of the Trinity is a great landmark that enables you to play a certain way. And that's part of why it makes it so strong, because typically with the Rus, they're going for that fast castle play, like we've already talked about with these two civilizations. And... With the, uh, the the Abbey of the Trinity enables you to get out on the map with your warrior monks quicker than you normally would be able to because you've got that monastery. It acts as a monastery and it also acts uh, for or gives you half the price of the uh, the cost of those warrior monks. And that's significant. That is really significant. Uh, also gives a unique upgrade for them. It's not as important, but the main thing is that it enables you to get out on the map nice and early and you can get out there before your enemy can you can secure those five relics. You can begin to secure the, the sacred sites. That's what makes it so damn strong. Next landmark that we've got up is again for the Rus, and it is the High Armory. The High Armory is an incredibly strong landmark. It enables you to get the 1.5 extra range tile or extra tiles of range for your Springholds. And already on top of the two range upgrade that they've got, the Roller Shutter Triggers, it takes them up to the highest range Springholds in the game, up to 13.5, and it makes them the strongest sprinkled in the game, the best sprinkled in the game, and as you guys know, sprinkled matter at the moment, that's all there is, and that's what makes them so damn good. So if you don't go that, you can't have the best sprinkled, and you kind of want to have the best sprinkled. Next landmark, it is going to be a Delhi Sultanate landmark, and it is a, uh, where is it? Where is she? Down here. Uh, so it is the House of Learning. House of Learning has got a very special upgrade in it. Well, it's actually, it's got three really good ones in there. Uh, so the first one is Honed Blades, uh, which gives you an extra... Uh, it gives you extra attack damage for both your knights and your men at arms. These two units are units that you are going to want to make. As soon as you get up to the castle age, it's basically all you're going to be making. You're going to be making these armored units. And the fact that it gives that bonus over, it's, it's pretty much a no-brainer as well. Uh, it also gives another great bonus, which doubles the population uh, bonus from your houses. So it re really means that uh, once you reach the mid-game, you don't really have to make those extra houses. And then the final one is that it uh, gives you that second wheelbarrow upgrade. So it's basically like wheelbarrow 2.0. Uh, it is available in the Imperial Age. A very, very nice tech. All right, well, moving on to the B tier. And we're going to start off with the Abbasid Dynasty. Uh, the military wing is going to go in the B tier. This is a very solid age up. That's why it sits in the B tier, not the C or the D. Um, it is a, an age up that you would typically, typically uh, go on a hybrid map, um, normally because the camel uh, support is the technology that you would be going for. On a hybrid map, typically you're going to be going for like a more fast castle based play um, or a little bit. If you're going to go for aggressive age two, you're going to be able to use the ships to uh, pay for the majority of your villages. So it's not so important for you to go an economic um, wing. And that's why the military wing is so damn strong. It gives you that extra plus one uh, arm off both ranged and uh, melee. And that's part of the reason why it's so good. Moving on to the next landmark. It's a Chinese landmark. It is the Barbican of the Sun. This landmark, there's really not much to it. It's basically just a glorified outpost. 
uh, that's it. it. It is very big though, which means that it does have, you know, that larger base means it's easier to garrison. Your vills don't have to run as far to garrison to it. So if you've got a hunt that is next to a gold mine, you stick this bad boy in the middle of it, you know, villagers from both sides can garrison into it. Um, other than that, yeah, there's nothing too much to it. Uh, but the, the, the reason why it's in the B tier is because it synergizes very well with the Chinese. So the Chinese, typically, they don't want to leave their base. And the fact that they get a defensive landmark in age or going up to age two, it really helps them out in doing that. They're very happy to give up map control in return for being able to make villages and lots of villages. And so being able to have that defensive uh, bonus or that defensive landmark synergizes very well with the civilization. And subsequently, I'm putting it up in the B tier just because I think it definitely helps out the civ more. If you had this landmark for any other civilization, it just wouldn't make sense. Uh, if you had it on the French, it would just be, it would be a D tier. It'd be like, well, what am I going to do with that? You know, School of Cavalry or this? It would obviously be School of Cavalry every single time. But for the French, or for the uh, Chinese, it makes total sense to have it here. So that is the first one. The next one up is the Spirit of the Way. I think that as we continue to see the meta become more greedy, Spirit of the Way will become more relevant for its uh, age up. The most common thing that we see players do is put a whole bunch of stables around this. Uh, so for anybody wondering, I, I probably should explain what it does because uh, you you, most people probably don't play Chinese. Uh, so the Spirit Way reduces the cost of dynasty units uh, for any unit that you've already unlocked in a dynasty. So as an example, that is the Chinese uh, Unique Crossbow. That is the Fire Lancer. That is the Grenadier. There's simply three units that you can unlock. That is it. And it reduces the cost down by 30%, which is pretty decent when you think about it. 30% cost reduction, that's pretty significant. Uh, but the problem is the Grenadier, it's a very expensive unit already, and it's very difficult to get to because you need to add in the second landmark. Uh, so you're only really looking at the unique Archer, the Chokunu, or you're looking at the Fire Lancer. So what you typically do, you go up with the uh, the Spirit Weight and you put a whole bunch of stables around it, and then you just spam out Fire Lancers from that. They're much cheaper. Uh, I think they actually work out to be cheaper than Horsemen, and they're better than Horsemen. So it is, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty decent landmark. Uh, so it sits up in the B tier, and I think it's going to just get better as the meta, uh, as as the China as China catches on and f people realize the power of Fire Lancers versus Mass Siege. I think uh, that this landmark is going to continue to work its way up uh, from B tier, probably even up into A tier. But we'll wait, we'll see how it goes. Next landmark that we're going to have is the Royal Institute. Now this landmark obviously goes up against the Guild Hall. Um, it is a it's a landmark that you rarely see, and typically this is a landmark that you would only really take in specific matchups where you wanted to finish your opponent early. You don't want the game to go late game. So if, if you're playing, you know, up against China and you know that China is, you know, they're, they're about to hit Castle Age, you got to be careful of them. You can go for this landmark here yourself and you can try and finish them early. If you've got mass knights, get them out, get that Royal Bloodline technology in because that's what it does. It enables you to unlock all of those unique technologies, even if they're available in the Imperial Age. This is a Castle Age landmark. It lets you get them in. So it's a super duper nice landmark for that. But if you're not going to finish the game, you know, if you're not if you're not planning to do a timing push with your veteran, um, your, your veteran Royal Knights and, and having that Royal Bloodline upgrade, then don't bother investing in this. That's pretty much it. Uh, it's basically just for the all in. Uh, next landmark that we are going to have is another French landmark, and it is, of course, the Red Palace. Red Palace is pretty darn good. I do like this landmark a lot. This landmark absolutely shreds anything that comes close to it, but, you know, j just like all landmarks that are similar to this, like any sort of defensive landmark and any sort of keep replacement, they are very prone to just being sieged down. So, that, you know, it, it, it's great for holding a position and it's great for dealing with raids, but it's going to be very uh, easy to just get sieged with bombards. That's that's essentially the bottom line. It is incredibly good, though. I do, it, it's, I've got to say, like, between these two, it's, I would probably take this one uh, most of the time. This one's obviously got a lot more utility in its extra range, uh, but this one just absolutely fucks. <laughs> That's probably the best way to say it. It fucks. All right, next landmark that we're going to be looking at is a Mongol landmark, and it is the Silver Tree. The Silver Tree is a little bit of a situational landmark, so it's good on maps like uh, French Pass, where you're far away from your enemy. You drop this bad boy down. You do what Doubt does. He, you do the Doubt Mongol uh, build order, where he opens up with this, and he gets a whole bunch of traders out. And then you move it to the corner of the map, and then those traders are going absolutely crazy with the amount of gold that they're bringing in. So that's uh, that's probably the best uh, way to use it. But the problem is, there's not a lot of maps that are actually viable for it. You know, you get like King of the Hill. It doesn't have a, a trading post on it. You get Arabia sometimes. They spawn in the middle of the map. And obviously, you've also got Deer Stones, which is an S tier landmark for Age 2. So does it, it, it can be very difficult to justify this landmark. But, you know, by itself, 
judging it on its own merits. It's still pretty good, but it is situational. And that's why it sits in B tier. Next landmark we're going to have up is the Kurul tie. The Kurul tie uh, similarly goes up against the uh, Step Redoubt, which is a B tier or an A tier rather, uh, and a very strong landmark in its own right. And as a result, it means that it reduces the strength of the Kurul tie. The Kurul tie is one of those landmarks that it is not necessarily situational, but it is uh, uh, one that you have to build a strategy around, in my opinion. You've got to be very careful with your Khan with this. We have seen it become a little bit stronger in the meta at the moment with Springholds. So essentially what we do see players do, pushing up with their Deer Stones, pushing up with their Kurul tie, and if they're, um, when their uh, Springholds get focused down, then they're pulling them back to the Kurul tie and having them get healed up. Uh, so that is one of the things that we're seeing. But at the moment, it, it does sit in the B tier. So not super duper good, but still relatively strong. Uh, and, and still a decent landmark. So the next one that we've got uh, coming up is going to be a Rus one, and it is, of course, the High Trade House. So the High Trade House is a uh, a landmark that gives you a lot of flexibility in the mid game. It is a gold trickle. So if you place this bad boy near uh, wood lines, it's going to be bringing you in a lot of gold at a bare minimum, about 200 gold a minute, which is two relics. And that's that's pretty good, uh, considering that you already, you know, if you've, if you've got relics and sacred sites, that you're already going to be having a, a pretty nice gold income there. Uh, on top of that, it allows you to be hitting your 500 bounty guaranteed just simply because it, cause it spawns that deer. The only problem is you're obviously going up against the Abbey of the Trinity um, and, you know, it is a very strong landmark and it, it's a little bit of a different play style. I would say it's a bit more boomy uh, to go for this one, uh, whereas this one's a bit more aggressive, but uh, it, it's still quite a decent landmark. So I do definitely rate it. Next landmark that we are going to have is going to be from the Delhi. And it is going to be the Palace of the Sultan. So in my opinion, this landmark is actually pretty decent. Um, but at the same time, it can be a little bit difficult. It is bugged. Um, but essentially, the, the way that it works is that it provides you a trickle of elephant archers or tower war elephants. And it provides them to you over the game uh, through... Uh, and, and it's accelerated rather with scholars. And so if you've got four scholars inside this bad boy, it's going to be pumping those guys out non-stop. But there is a caveat in that you're obviously not going for the Hussar Academy. Um, I, I think that this is quite a strong landmark in that it's giving you a very gold-heavy unit throughout the game. Gold is obviously that resource that's so important. You really need to try and keep as much of it as possible and, and you know, really save those units and make sure that they're, they're not dying. And I think at the moment, just the way that the meta is, the fact that Springled's Bombards are so strong, these units die very quickly. And so that's why... It's not sitting any higher. I would love to be putting it up in the AT, but in reality, I think at the moment in the current meta, it sits at about B. All right, moving on to the next landmark, and it is going to be down in the C tier, and it is once again the Abbasid Dynasty that we'll be starting off with, and it is the Culture Wing. So I think that this is a C tier. I really do rate the Culture Wing. I do think it is a great landmark or a, a great wing, uh, but the issue is that anything else that you would rather have or r rather, I would just rather have the these two. That that's the issue, right? Like, w you could you could say so many things about like, oh, you could say like the Royal Institute. It's a really good landmark. Yeah, it is. But I'd just rather have the Guildhall, and it becomes the same here. I would rather have, uh, you know, the military wing if I'm going to play aggressive in Age Two. I would rather have the economic wing if I'm going to do a two TC boom. The only time I would prefer the culture wing is if I'm playing on a full water map. So if I'm playing Archipelago, if I'm playing Warring Islands, then I would get this, uh, the culture wing. Other than that, it is pretty much going to be relegated to, you know, C tier. Um, and that is why it sits there. Uh, it does have some interesting text towards the late game, but realistically, these two wings are going to be your primary wings most of the time. Uh, it will be occasional that you do go up to the castle age with this. And well, you know what? When I say occasional, it's probably about a, a you know, 30% of the time you'll be going up with it, uh, but definitely not enough to trump these two uh, from their respective slots. So next landmark that we're going to be talking about is the Wingard Palace. So we've already talked about the Berkshire Palace. Now we're going to be talking about the Wingard Palace uh, for the English uh, so the Wingard Palace is a landmark that obviously goes up against uh, this guy up here, uh, which is the um, the Berkshire Palace. And with the Wingard Palace, it, it, it is good, standalone. But the problem is that in the current meta, it really doesn't give you a lot of what you need. It gives you one of everything. It gives you uh, one Spearman. It gives you one Men at Arms, one Knight. I think it gives you like one Crossbow and then one Trebuchet, which, you know, it sounds very good. And it's a very affordable price. Uh, for that as well, but the reality of late game and the way that controlling the map 
is to be able to get a free keep that operates in this way just makes this such a viable option compared to the Wingard Palace, which doesn't give you any form of map control. It means that you're going to have to end up castling another place that's going to cost you more resources. And as a result, you know, it, this comes at a perfect time, whereas this, you know, you, you're not really in a position where you're going to be needing to use that. And that's why it sits in C tier. The other C tier for the English, and I probably should have come first just so those guys with OCD uh, don't get um, don't get upset. It is the White Tower. So the White Tower, it comes too early in my opinion. So there is a window that you want to be getting out onto the map and that you want to be putting keeps down. But this comes too early. So this comes at around like the 15 minute, the 17 minute mark, uh, sometimes a little bit earlier than that. And when, when you are comparing it to something like this, you, you're not at a stage where you're really looking to secure map controls with keep or map control with a keep. Uh, and once you're in the late game, though, that is definitely where you're looking at securing those large gold mines with the keeps or the large stone mines, stone outcroppings with the keep. And that's why this landmark is quite decent. But the, the, the main issue with this is that it's going up against the King's Palace. And with the King's Palace obviously being an S tier landmark, you're going to be taking this one 99% of the time. And compared to this one, at that stage of the game, it just, as I mentioned, it just comes too early. And that's why it sits in C tier. Next landmark that is going to sit in C tier is the Chinese. It is the Imperial. I want to say the Imperial Academy. Uh, it is actually the Imperial Palace, I do apologize. Uh, so the Imperial Palace, it's interesting. It is the only, it's the only landmark in the game that gives you map hacks, legal map hacks. Um, I tested this with a lot, uh, 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 I, sorry, I should say I tested this a lot in the early stages of uh, the beta. Uh, I would do like a fast castle with lances and then go up and, and sort of just find uh, the villagers using this. And, and it does work very well. It's quite good for team games. Uh, but for 1v1, obviously, you're going up against the Astronomical Clock Tower. And with the way that the current meta is set, it's rare to sort of be doing raids on villagers uh, and knowing where their positions are. It just seems a little bit strange um, because you're typically going to know where your enemy's villagers are anyway. You're going to know, oh, okay, he's probably finished his main gold now. Where's his second gold? There it is. Okay, that's where I'm going to send my horsemen. That sort of thing. Uh, and obviously, you can use this for confirmation, but you've got to pay a lot for it. It also gives a pretty big line of sight radius, but in my opinion, it's not really worth it. Just considering how often people are putting up towers in their bases now. I don't know about you guys. I'm using a lot of towers, a lot of outposts. That gives me a huge amount of line of sight. And so this sort of gets nullified in that regard and subsequently sits in the C tier. Next C tier landmark is going to be the Chamber of Commerce from the French. Very, very strong on water maps. That's it. Uh, so I'm not really viable on land maps. Uh, not, it, it's kind of viable on hybrid maps. Uh, as well, but typically you are going to see people just go for the um, the uh, School of Cavalry instead, uh, and so it sits down there. So it acts as a market. It doesn't give you any better rates, but it does give you a better rate of trading, but it's very rare that we actually see players use it for that uh, specific mechanic. So it sits in the CT up at the moment. Next one up in the CT is going to be the Minework Palace. Initially, this was considered very, very strong. Uh, because it does give a discounted black, blacksmith rates. So you don't have to pay that 150 wood for the blacksmith to get those upgrades. But very quickly, people learned how to deal with men at arms. They learned very quickly how to deal with men at arm all ins. And subsequently, this slowly fell down the rankings. You know, I'm sure on day one, when um, when the Holy Roman Empire came out, this was STR and everyone was just using it. The Minework Palace, you know, full upgrades. Woo! Yeah, but then it, it, it fell down. And so now it sits down in C tier. The next landmark that also sits in C tier is this bad boy right here, the Ellsback Palace. Uh, Ellsback Palace is bugged at the moment. You can't use the emergency repair on it. Uh, so it doesn't matter where you put it, you will just never be able to emergency repair it. Uh, and that affects it significantly. To be honest, it should probably be in the D tier just because of that bug. But we'll ignore it for now and we'll assume that they fix it. But even then, it's it's a good landmark. It reduces the incoming damage for, from any building that's within its radius, which sounds great. But you got to remember that typically when it comes to buildings and, and their destruction and things like that, it, it's, look, it's a matter of time. It's one of those things, right? Like, I, I don't know too much about the way other people play, but I know that with, with regard to the way I play, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to have two, three bombards out. And, you know, whether it takes me 20 seconds longer to kill your palace or your, your Ellsback palace or to kill a keep, I'm not going to be too fast. 20 seconds is not a lot of time. It's not going to buy you the time that you need to be able to counter that effectively. Like, sure, you might be able to get out, you know, an extra scout or an extra two scouts or something like that before you push, but it's not going to be enough to make a difference, at least in my opinion. And that's why it sits in the C tier. Next landmark coming up in the C tier is the Kremlin. Now, the Kremlin is a very similar landmark to the Chinese Barbican, but keep in mind, with the Kremlin, you're uh, you're basically doing the same thing, but it's with a different sieve. 
So earlier, I mentioned that the reason why the Barbican was so good for the Chinese sitting up in the B tier is that it synergizes as well with the bonuses of the Chinese. And while definitely the Wooden Fortress uh, has a great uh, bonus, you know, that's included in the Kremlin in that it buffs up your wood lines, it's not necessarily enough to justify having it because typically you're going to be playing most of the time for rules, at, at least at the moment, they're doing one base play. They're going one town, Santa Fast Castle. That's pretty much it. They go professional scouts into uh, Abbey of the Trinity. And so there's not really much room for this. You know, you don't really need to have it. You don't need to get out onto the map, that sort of thing. And so it's sort of fall, it's fallen down in the meta, especially with how strong the, the Golden Gate is. It, it unfortunately sits down here, but I do expect we will see it come up uh, when this guy does get nerfed. And if we do see that meta change uh, with the reduction in strength of the Abbey of the Trinity. Um, all right, now moving on to the next landmark, and it is the Spaskaya Tower. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm just going to double check. Yes, the Spaskaya Tower uh, for the uh, the Rus. I think just primarily because you're going up against the... Um, the other landmark, which is the High Armory. It makes it very, very weak. And of course, th this is a landmark that once again is similar to the Ellsback Palace. It is similar to the um, the Red Palace as well. Um, and it, it acts as that late game fort. And it does come at a good time. Uh, but typically the issue is for me that it is doing something uh, that you really don't need at that time. And w primarily what you need is you need to have those sprinkled upgrades. And that's part of the reason why. So even though I, I would love to like talk more about this, it's hard because it's mutually exclusive with the high armory. And I'm just like, you know, this is so damn good. I can't ever imagine myself not going for this. Like maybe if I'm dying, but then the thing is like, even if I'm dying, if I'm on the edge and I need a castle dropped immediately, I'm just, you, you know, like you're, you're, what's the word? You're cutting off your nose to spite your face. It's a double-edged sword. Sure, you go up and you stay alive, but you're still going to die because you don't have the high armory. At least that's the way I think about it. Next landmark that we're going to have is the Hussar Academy. Hussar Academy is currently bugged. I think if it becomes, a, if it is unbugged, it will be much better. Uh, probably would even move up to potentially up to the A tier. Uh, but for now, it's just going to sit in the C tier. Uh, my argument against the Hussar Academy is that you have access to uh, farms. Okay, and sure, farms are expensive, but you have access to them. You have a, a source of infinite food throughout your game. And so it, it kind of doesn't really make sense to me to go for a landmark that is going to give you access to infinite food already, or to at least give you a trickle of food so late in the game. If this was a trickle of gold, I would be totally on board. But, it, uh, you know, if it was a trickle of gold, I'd probably be putting it in the S tier. But it's a trickle of food. And food is something that is readily available. Now, obviously, it's going to mitigate any potential farms that you you. Uh, want to make as well so as an example you know it might get to the point where it's worth like 15 villages on farms so you don't have to make those farms but typically once you're getting towards the imperial age farms aren't going to be an issue investing you know 700 wood into farms isn't going to be a super duper big issue when you're sitting at 30 minutes into the game when you're sitting at 160 population and 100 villager population it's not going to be you know a big concern for you and that's why i think it sits in the c tier Next landmark that we are going to have is, of course, another Abbasid Dynasty landmark, and it's going to be sitting in the D tier. It's the Trade Wing. The Trade Wing. Oh, gosh, the Trade Wing. The uh, the most underused wing in the game, definitely. Now, that's not saying that it's bad. It's not. The only issue is that it becomes useful too late. I do genuinely think this is a good wing. It offers great bonuses, especially the first bonus that it gives you in the Second Age is a very good bonus. The only thing is, all of these three are going to come before it, and it's only in the late game that you're going to be adding in trade, but there is a caveat here, and that is I would expect that people on maps that have got very favorable uh, trading posts would actually start going to the Imperial Age with the trade wing. So instead of going up with the culture wing up to the, the Imperial Age or you know going up with the military wing or something like that, they would actually go up with the trade wing. Now keep in mind, you can actually do a post-Imperial with this civilization. You can get access to all four of these landmarks at the same time, all four of these wings at the same time. So even once you've gone up to Imperial with three of these landmarks, or three of these wings rather, you can then add the fourth one in afterwards. So you can get all four of these and you can get all four of the bonuses. Uh, so that's something to note. But I, ideally, I, I, as I mentioned, I do think this is a good good wing with good technologies. It's just at the moment, it's not something that you see a lot of because we don't see a lot of late game games. Uh, but I, I do think once we do get there, Abbasid is actually going to be one of the strongest late game sieves, if not the strongest late game sieve, simply because of this trade wing. This trade wing is absolutely insane. Um, uh, and I'd love to talk more about that. In fact, I, I will just say a little bit more about that just because this is such a long form video. Uh, to compare this to the Chamber of, of I was going to call it the Chamber of Secrets, the Chamber of Commerce, 
this is a mutually exclusive decision that you have to make it three minutes into the game. You, you, you This is 30% increasing trade. This is also 30%, if I remember correctly, it might be 25% uh, increases on trade. So why isn't, why am I talking so highly about this and putting it in D tier when this one, you know, we talked about it really badly, but we still put it in C tier. This is a mutually exclusive decision that you have to make. And so you're almost always going to be choosing this one. This is something that you can add in at any point in the game. And it's not mutually exclusive. You can always come back to it, which is why it's so strong. Um, so we'll talk more about that. Obviously, once late game becomes a more relevant aspect, it's definitely going to be moving up. I wouldn't be surprised to see this move up towards B tier, maybe even up to A tier. Uh, but uh, that is something to keep an eye out on. Next up in the D tier, we're going to have the Abbey of the King. It is a landmark that is absolutely, in my opinion, useless. Um, there are so many requirements for this. Units must be nearby. Units must be out of combat. Uh, units, um, so to be out of combat, they can't have uh, been hit or hit within the last 15 seconds. Um, the AoE is quite small. It It's only four per second. And on top of that, the Longbowman, which typically is going to be the, the, the big part of your army, has already got a healing ability. Uh, the, the fire camp's ability. So it just, it doesn't synergize well. There, there are a couple of circumstances I could think this might be viable. Let's say you're playing on, you know, you're playing a 2v2 and you, you're, you don't have a teammate and it's just a random and you choose English and your teammate chooses English. Are you gonna, guys going to go double longbow? I mean, you could and it would probably work, but one of you probably will go cavalry. And it kind of makes sense if one of you does go cavalry, don't go for the, um, for the council hall. Maybe go for this one. That's the only situation I can think of. But just, you know, the current way that the matter is, I can't imagine anybody using this landmark at all. Uh, very, very useless detail. Uh, next one up is the Imperial Academy. Another amazing... I shouldn't be sarcastic here. Another landmark that is pretty useless. Uh, this landmark doubles up the tax that you can generate on your buildings. Tax is already a system that you guys know I've got a lot of criticism about. Um, but essentially, the way that this works it doesn't offer you enough of an immediate bonus to be justified any higher tier. The, the the landmarks that you see at the top here give you immediate bonuses. So you've got this one, which acts as, you know, an immediate 300 wood. This one here, which acts as an immediate town center. This one acts as an immediate siege workshop with added benefit being the extra 50% HP. This is an immediate... Um, an immediate uh, artillery found, or an immediately uh, uh, immediate. Oh my gosh, I'm going crazy here, guys. Um, stable. This is an immediate mosque with added bonus. This is, I mean, this is a little bit different. Um, but you you see where I'm coming from with this, though. Whereas the immediate bonus for this literally doesn't exist. It is just like it is. It's gonna for this to pay off. It would probably take like 86 minutes in a game. Like that. That's the thing. The only reason why people build this is because they need to build it to get to the dynasty. That's it. Terrible landmark. Next landmark that's terrible, this one here. Increases the uh, HP of your walls, your the hit points of your walls. Might sound good. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, less experienced players probably think that sounds really good. But as I mentioned before, with the Ellsback Palace, part of the reason why it's weak is because if I have to take an extra 20 seconds to get through your walls with my bombards, I'm not too fast. That's not a big deal. You're only just, you're delaying me. You're not preventing me. You're just delaying me. You're delaying the inevitable. It's not going to stop the outcome of the game. And that's my opinion here as well. I think if, if someone is going to get down a stone wall, they're going to need to bring siege. And if they're going to bring siege, the stone wall is going to die no matter what. And so it's like, it, it, it yeah, it's, it's difficult. Uh, and then it's also got another bonus where the units around it, if they're standing on the wall, will also get a damage bonus. But remember the way that sieges work in this game you're not going to really be fighting outside the walls like that up against units that are on top of the walls because typically enemies are just going to back out and then they're just going to bring in their trebuchets or they're going to bring in their bombards so it do it's not a really big bonus um so that would be it uh the next one up is the uh for the rus uh so this one here is the burgrave palace burgrave palace it, it enables you to train or batch train units so you can train in batches of five so first and foremost it's going up against the regnitz cathedral and the only time you would ever really want Burgrave Palace over the Regnitz Cathedral is if your enemy has been in Castle Age for like 10 minutes and you still haven't gotten up, which as a Holy Roman Empire player, you should be prioritizing. If, if there's one civilization that wants to reach Castle Age in this game, the fastest, 
it is the Holy Roman Empire. There is no other Civ here that wants to go up faster than them. You, you Fast Castle should be the name of your game 99% of the time. And because of that, this guy sits down here. Uh, on top of that, you also don't, you only have the option to batch train. So as an example, I come from Age of Empires 3. If I want to train, if I want to batch train units, I can put one in the queue, okay? And then I can click four more times and it will go one, two, three, four, and add that fifth one in, okay? And then I can pop them out all at the last second. Whereas this, you need it all up front to pay for it, which I mean, sure, I'm, I accept that, but just, uh, yeah, uh, that mechanic just makes it very difficult to deal with. Uh, the next one that we're going to be putting in is the Mongolian uh, landmark. So this one here is the Kaganet Palace. And once again, going up against, you know, the White Stupa, it's going to make it very difficult to justify because obviously this one here, it's an it's a second Uvu. It is going to be giving you that extra stone source where this one, it trains a Mangadai, it trains a Horseman, it trains a Lancer. I think it, 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 that's essentially what it does every minute, which is a lot of resources, but at the same time, it's not really uh, enabling you to, uh, to specialize in something. You are being... Uh, given a whole bunch of things and when you get to the imperial age you're not going to be able to afford elite upgrades for your mangadai elite upgrades for your horsemen elite upgrades for all of those units there's so many units that it's giving you for and so the majority of those units are probably just going to be useless like uh, if you haven't used mangadai the entire game you're they're still going to be sitting in age two you're going to need to get you know veterancy you're going to need to get elite upgrades for them and so as a result it means this becomes a less powerful landmark Next one is up uh, for the Delhi. And so we have the Tower of Victory, aka the Tower of Defeat. If you build this, you will lose. That is the bottom line. It is incredibly bugged. The only unit that this um, would actually be good for, the Men at Arms, it doesn't affect them. It, it's bugged. Um, so that is it. So it's meant to increase the attack speed of your units. It, it says about 15%. Um, it, it's all around the place, the way that it works. Uh, I, I can see why they've done it for balance reasons. But um, yeah, it doesn't work on the Men at Arms. And the Men at Arms in the current meta are very, very strong. So, uh, look, I, I think if they fixed it for Men at Arms, it would probably be actually quite decent, um, especially if you were to combine it with this landmark. So giving you an extra, I think it's plus three or plus four damage. So if you get like plus three or plus four damage a swing and then combine it with plus 15% attack speed, like you could probably see this up up this far. Like th that's the kind of power that this could have if Men at Arms actually uh, worked. So... Who knows whether they are going to fix that up. And the next one up is the Compound of the Defender. I know some people absolutely love the Compound of the Defender, but in my opinion, it is just one of those landmarks where it gets so easily outclassed by its uh, respective, um, you know, uh, mutually exclusive landmark that it just unfortunately, it's it's just not going to work. It, it, it sounds good. It does reduce the cost of emplacements, I believe. I believe it reduces the cost of the stone walls and the stone towers as well, which does sound nice. If, you, if you're going to play that style of game, I'm sure you could probably get something working, but in the current meta, it's just not going to fit. Anyway, fellas, that's been your Age of Empires 4 landmark tier list. I hope you've enjoyed it. I know that not everybody's going to agree with it, so I ask that you, if you don't agree with it, don't downvote the video. Just, um, just leave a comment. Try and be polite and explain why. If you did enjoy the video, leave a like, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Thank you guys so much for watching.